Welcome back to Questing Beast, I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Errant, which is a fantasy role-playing game system by Ava Islam. And it markets itself as being rules light and procedure heavy. So what that means is that the basic rules of the system, how you resolve most actions, it's very straightforward. It's mostly a d20 roll, it's roll under. Um, but it also has a lot of procedures, which you can think of as little subsystems or mini games that you can use to resolve all the different parts of a role-playing game that are often kind of glossed over in other systems. Here, there's a whole little structure for them to give them a little bit more strategy and a little bit more heft. Now, there are a lot of these in Errant, but one of the nice things is, is that the book is extremely modular. You can use all of these systems together and it makes a complete role-playing game, or you can take out the parts that you like and cobble them together and adapt them into whatever system you happen to be using. Here's the inside front cover. There's rules quick references right here, which is really great. It's over three pages, really, that goes into the basic re resolution of how you do tests, uh, how you do travel turns, because there's a whole system for that, exploration turns, and then at the back of the book, it has three more pages looking at uh, downtime, tur downtime turns, beg your pardon, and uh, initiative turns, which is basically combat, death and dying, chases, initiative, and things like that. And if you look at these three pages, they are in the three pages at the front, that's gonna cover most of the rules that you really need to know. All the stuff on the inside is gonna give you a lot more um, material that you can use in your game and just more rules to help flesh things out a bit. One really nice thing is that the text of this book, not the art, is offered under a Creative Commons license, which means that anyone is free to distribute the text and adapt it within the scope of the license as long as you give the authors credit, which is very generous and allows for people to do a lot of hacking quite easily with this stuff. Before we dig into the meat of the book though, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of online classes for anyone who wants to develop their creativity and learn new skills. They've got classes on creating your own fantasy maps, drawing old school D&D dungeons, world building, character illustration, and many more topics for old school DMs. I just started taking a class by Patrick Inhofer called Da Vinci Resolve 16, the complete video editing course to improve my editing skills. And I've already found all sorts of shortcuts and tools to make my life easier. The whole platform is completely ad-free, and the first 1,000 people to use the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. That will let you check out their classes and dive in right away. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring. Now let's get back to the show. All right, let's take a look inside. There is a lot of information in this book, as I mentioned before, so we're not gonna be able to go through everything in detail. I'll just try and hit the highlights and some of the things that really stood out to me. We start off with an introduction and a summary of who you are. You are a failure. You are an errant. You're a loser who has nothing better to do than to rob tombs and try and get gold and almost certainly die in the process. Your life is not worth anything. You have four different attributes here, physique, skill, mind, and presence, which are rolled using 4d4. That'll give you a range between four and 16. And it's a roll under system. So you're gonna roll a d20, try and roll under your attribute rating and above the difficulty value. So for example, if you have an attribute of, uh, let's say 12 in your skill, and you're trying to do a task that has a difficulty of four, you would need to roll between four and 12. If you get in between those, then you have succeeded. Otherwise you have failed. There is a system here for converting difficulty values from more standard D&D games that might use a difficulty class uh, instead of this difficulty value. There's also a position and impact system here, which I believe is derived from things like uh, Blades in the Dark, where when the uh, a character is trying to resolve an action, the game master can say what their position is, risky, uh, shaky, risky, or dire, which basically tells you how bad the outcome is gonna be if you fail, and the impact, strong, fair, or weak, which tells you how much you're gonna accomplish if you succeed. Most of the actual action in the game takes place in turns. So there's travel turns for traveling across uh, the landscape, exploration turns, that's more for dungeon crawling, initiative turns for combat, and downtime turns for resting in a city and trying to get things done. And each of these has its own subsystem that you can use to generate complications as you are doing those things. This is the event die that you roll in each of those turn structures. And you may recognize this from my uh, game, Nave Second Edition, which I'm working on right now. Um, Errant and Nave both derived this idea from Brendan over at the blog Necropraxis, who came up with this system of rolling a die to determine events rather than tracking each of them individually. Generally, it always works like this. You roll a d6 every time one of these turns goes by. One is an encounter, two is a delay, three is a resource use, four is a local effect, five is a clue, and six means it's free, nothing really happens. And then each of these different outcomes is adapted to each of those particular circumstances. For example, here we have travel turns, 
where the event die for number two, which is normally delay, becomes you're forced to rest, and a resource use becomes deplete all rations and lower all supply by one. Whereas in exploration turns, which are in a dungeon, you're gonna have to rest every once in a while or gain exhaustion, and the resource loss is burn all light sources and lower all supply by one. And you can also deplete active sorceries and miracles, which we'll talk about later. So light becomes more of a resource here where it isn't really in the travel turns. Downtime turns are a little bit different because you have things like complications, expirations, you have trends that could be affecting the city, an intimation of new things or new adventures that may be coming. So it's tweaked a little bit, but the structure is still basically the same. There is a whole subsystem here for negotiations. It doesn't recommend that you use this anytime you talk to an NPC, that would get very onerous. Um, but if you have a high level negotiation that you need to do, like you're in a trial or you need to negotiate for prisoners or something like that, you can actually use this subsystem, which will set like what the person's initial reaction to you is and what their disposition is. And then you can try and alter that up and down by taking different uh, moves, where you can do things like a giving exchange, where you give them something, a taking exchange, where you demand something, a convincing exchange, a bribe exchange. You take these different actions to try and move things in your direction. Because equipment and encumbrance is a big deal in this game, there's a whole system here for item slots, which I approve of. That's definitely easier to use than tracking all of the individual weights of objects. You just have a number of slots that you can fill up. And you can mark things as handy and worn, uh, depending on how easy they are to get to. Rules for containers, exhaustion, as an encumbrance system, which is a little bit complicated, reminds me a bit of lamentation system, where you get one encumbrance for every 25% of your item slots that you've filled. And the more encumbrance you have, the worse things are for you. For example, it can simply reduce your speed. There is a type of resource that your characters can carry called supply, which is like an abstracted um, account of how much extra stuff that you've brought. So it's kind of like quantum inventory. It's not quite quantum inventory because you can't just use it to magically produce whatever item you need. It only allows you to get extra copies of stuff that you're already carrying. So for example, if your torch burns out, you could spend some supply to say, I have another torch, but you couldn't suddenly produce like a lantern or a magic key or something like that. The armor system is ablative, so it reduces damage that enemies deal to you. When you're dealt damage, you can spend a block, which is the term, you're, the different pieces of armor that you have have a certain number of blocks attached to them. If you send, spend a block on a piece of armor, you can take the damage die that is being dealt to you and reduce it by one step. So for example, if you're getting dealt a D6 of damage, you could spend a block and turn it into a D4 of damage. When you rest, if you have an armor repair kit, then you can restore all of your blocks. We have a section here for magic weapons and armor. Like in early D&D, you might have a sword that's a plus two sword, meaning it's a specially magical sword. The way that this interprets that is if you have, say, a plus two sword, that gives you two true strikes, which allows you to max out the damage on all of your dice two times. That's only going to refresh once you go back to a city and have a rest. Similarly, if you have specially magic armor, that armor can give you deflex, which allows you to nullify one instance of damage entirely. There's a rarity system right here where the rarer different objects are that you might want to buy, the larger the city you're going to have to look for. So super rare items that are rarity five, you have to be in a metropolis before you can even find them at all. There's also a system here for quality and breakage. If you want to track items getting worn out and eventually broken. Like I said, there's a lot of systems in here, but you can really take and leave what you want. A big section here on goods and services, including what the prices are, uh, how many slots they take up, any uh, blocks they give you, if it's armor, what their rarity is, what their depletion is, if it's something that can be worn out, and so on and so forth. Got animals, clothing, vehicles, books, services, buildings, retainers. It's quite comprehensive. There's four different kinds of retainers that you can hire, because this is the sort of game where you're getting lots of people to help do your work for you. Um, despite being a, a fairly new school-ish game, it definitely is oriented towards the kind of campaigns that you might find in these MMO style AD&D games, where you have lots of players uh, controlling multiple characters, adventuring around in different times and places in one game world. It's definitely a game where you're controlling a party, not necessarily just one person. So you have hirelings, you have specialists, lots of different examples right here. And there's mercenaries that will fight for you in the field, but will not follow you into a dungeon. And henchmen who are like specialized companions that fight alongside you. When you create a PC, you're gonna roll your four attributes, choose your ancestry. These are abstracted into tough, arcane, cunning, and adaptable. So you can easily slot in whatever fantasy races your setting has into these different categories. And you can get a failed pro uh, profession and a keepsake. There's a random table for those and your archetype, which is basically your class. The violent, which is like a fighter, deviant, which is a rogue or a thief, the occult, which is a wizard, and the zealot, which is a cleric. Here's some of the big list of keepsakes that you can start out with, like a hand drum or a trio of newborn puppies. 
some failed professions, which might help you do certain tasks if the Game Master is feeling generous. And you have your Renown system right here. Your Renown is your levels. It goes from one to nine, really. And here's the XP needed to get there. When you level up, uh, the company, the, all of the, the people in the group are gonna choose one of your four attributes that you should raise, and then you will choose another one that you should raise. I like that half of your um, attributes being raised are being chosen by the other people playing with you, because the idea is that they chose the uh, attribute that you were using the most or that most fits the situation, whereas one allows you to expand off in a different direction. And the way you gain XP is that you gain one for every penny that you waste. That's very important. You have to throw it away on something useless. If you spend on something useful, it's no good. Here it recommends that you can get an adjutant, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, um, where you can basically get a sidekick who joins you at level two and takes a split of your XP. But you can only have one of these sidekicks in your entire lifetime. So if they die, then you can't get another one. However, if you die, that sidekick can easily be promoted to be your new player character, which helps take the sting out of the probably high rate of death that these characters are going to be seeing. All right, let's take a look at our classes. We have the fighter class, the violent, and they get a number of attacks that's gonna go up over the time as they level up, and they're gonna get feats and combat dice. So as they level up, they're gonna get more of these feats that they're gonna pick that give them more combat options, and they're gonna get more combat dice that they can spend to power these particular feats. So for example, you could spend uh, some of your combat dice on smite. When you make an attack roll, you may roll a combat die and add it to your damage. And these all work slightly differently, but basically these are points that you spend to do these super abilities. If you're a thief, then you get these proficiencies. You start with a few proficiency points and you gain more as you level up. That's, that allows you to pick these specialized skills. And if you choose the same skill more than once, you can upgrade it to mastery where you become incredibly good at it. If you're a master at a particular skill, not only does it make your position better when you accomplish something, a lot of times you'll have really high impact when you succeed, but also it often gives you a special ability. So for example, if you have sleight of hand, and you've upgraded it to mastery, then you're now a pack rat. You can retrieve any item in any item slot as if it were a handy slot. We also have a slightly story gamey element right here called Jetons. I'm not sure why they're called that. Maybe that's something I, I just don't know the meaning of. And it can be represented by poker chips. Basically, they allow you to bet on the outcome of things, which seems very in keeping with a rogue. So you can spend a number of these poker chips to say, I know how to disarm this trap, or I've already stolen their weapon. So you can do kind of a flashback mechanic, a little bit like Blades in the Dark. And if you succeed at that bet, you have to make a roll and try and roll under the number of coins that you bet, then it works. But if not, then things are going to get a lot worse for you. Now the occult are wizards. They have a whole bunch of different special abilities. They can cast sorceries out of grimoires, of which they start with four of. And these can be cast out of the book uh, once per day per book, or you can try and memorize them. And if you memorize them, then there's a whole system where you have to roll to try and succeed, and you can miscast if you fail. It's a little complicated because spells that you've memorized can become unstable when you fail at the roll, and then they can be move on to being miscast, I think, if you fail again. So there's like a bit of tracking that you have to do there. I'm not sure if I'm a big fan of that, um, but it is a way to sort of separate the uh, stability and the reliability of being always able to cast out of books with a little bit more of the risk of trying to cast things even more out of your mind. You have a Maleficence ability, which is basically a way to take any memorized spell and turn it into a damage spell, which I think is derived from another work of Brendan from Necro Praxis, uh, his book Wonder and Wickedness, which is one of my favorite spell books. Uh, I think this idea is from there. And it works really well. So you don't have to clutter up your spell book with lots of different kinds of damage spells. You can just come up with your own, like a lightning, for example. And that's my thing. My thing is lightning. And you can turn any spell into a lightning spell so that most of your other spells can be interesting uh, problem-solving type spells. You also have a number of retorts right here. Basically, this is a kind of a counter spell. You have a certain number of times um, that you can cast one of your prepared spells in response to an enemy. This allows for a sort of wizard duel to occur, where if you have enough retorts left, then you can try and counter them or hit them before they hit you. Now, zealots who are like clerics have a favor rating, which is the amount of favor they have with their particular deity, and that can be increased by doing jobs for that deity. You'll spend them like spell points in order to pull off miracles, and you have relics all the way up to four relics that you can carry. The more relics you have, the more powerful than that the miracles you can cast. The four different relics that you're able to have are blades, wands, talismans, and chalices, though you could retheme that, I suppose, if you wanted to. Blades helping you to deal damage, wands helping you succeed at ability checks, talismans are uh, protective, and chalices can grant immunity to certain statuses to your friends. One interesting thing about the sorcery system is that it's a combination of the grimoire you find and the spell that is in it. So, and those are not going to be necessarily the same. There's a whole big list of grimoires down here that we're going to look at. But basically, when you get a grimoire, well, actually, let's take a look at an example that might help. 
So here's a one that is a pair of pristine boots fashioned with the insignia of a wing. To learn this sorcery, deliver a message from one world to another. So there's always some sort of crazy task you have to accomplish. When you do that, you've unlocked this grimoire and you get the spell inside. Down here is the random table for uh, miscast, basically. Now, the actual spell that's inside is going to be randomly generated, which is always fun. So you're going to combine just these two tables. So it could be a request spirit or curse life or switch mind, right? So you roll in these two tables and now you know basically what it does. And you have to take that general description and you match it up with the themes from that spell book. So if the themes are fortification, repair, and construction, you have to find a way to integrate those things together to describe what the spell actually does. There's a number of example sorceries here that show you basically how you would go about doing that. And there's a section on converting spell scrolls and spell books from traditional Vancean D&D spells into the system if that's what you want to do. There are 100 different pre-designed grimoires for you, which is really nice. That has plenty of great content for spellcasters so that you always have new stuff to throw at your players. Now, if you're a cleric, you're going to have a particular deity or patron that you are devoted to. So this is an example one right here. So in this case, you have blessings. So these are special abilities that you can always perform. And then we have some doctrines that goes into exactly how uh, your particular deity works. The different miracles that you can cast are broken into five different levels called doctrines, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, with the descriptions underneath kind of describing how that works. Now, this whole example uh, deity right here is really the only example in the book. So you're going to have to use this as a template to create your own deities with this in mind. When you want to cast a miracle, you describe what you want to do to the game master and they figure out what doctrine level it is using this as a guideline down here. And then you're going to roll. You're going to roll a D6 plus an extra D6 for every relic that you own. So you start off with just one relic and then if you get to the highest level, you could have four, as I mentioned before. And the total tells you what the uh, result of your miracle is. You can also add to this roll by spending those uh, spell points. What are they called? Favor in order to increase your roll. On the highest result, a boon means that your miracle was successful. If it's a pact, then it's successful, but there's often a cost or your deity asks something of you before it's going to be accomplished. If it's four through six, then it's woe. Something bad is going to happen. You roll on this table of things that could happen, including possibly you dying. Um, and the very lowest is apotheosis, where you just straight up die. Your body erupts, giving birth to a physical manifestation of your covenant, an avatar of a deity or belief otherwise made manifest. You are dead. So... There is a chance of you dying basically every time you cast a miracle, unless you can force it to always be a pact or a boon. So if you have enough favor points, you can avoid these two lowest results entirely just by spending enough. Um, but that's going to be pretty tricky to do, especially at early levels. At early levels, you don't have very much favor. And you're going to be at least hitting the uh, woe pretty often and maybe even apotheosis, unless you find a way to quickly, quickly increase the number of favor points you have. I'm not sure if I'm a big fan of that, because basically it says you're a zealot, you have a god and you're going to be casting miracles, but doing your thing, casting miracles could result in you dying. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that. I think that's a little bit too easy to happen um, until you're at higher levels. So I might tone down some of the consequences here just to encourage players to use that ability more. You also have a standard beneficence ability, which just allows you to heal people. But again, you are rolling on this table once again, where the possibility is you just die, or rather the target just dies because any of the consequences to beneficence would apply to the person you're trying to heal. Um, this is a little bit strange that healing someone could possibly kill them if you um, roll badly. And it, it's a little bit odd because you could use this as an offensive weapon, right? You could find like some arch enemy, some powerful wizard that you couldn't kill otherwise and just try and heal them and just only spend one die and hopefully just kill them by getting a bad roll. I don't know. It seems a little odd to me, and it seems like the, the consequences are just a little bit too tough. There's a really nice table right here for gaining favor, um, permanently gaining favor, so like your maximum increases. So doing little stuff like solving the plight of a stranger might give you one favor, uh, uncover a great deception, five favor, or 15 favor for doing a really important work for your deity. Here's a table of woe. And again, each of these tables is customized to the deity. So if you're going to have a player with a cleric, you're going to have to probably work with them to design this yourself, or I guess use this kind of generic version that uh, is a template that you can use. And you can just roll on this table and then just theme it toward whatever god they happen to be worshiping. The last section of the book just goes into all the different types of turns. So we have uh, travel turn actions. Um, so every time the travel turn goes by, you pick one of these actions for the party, like move from one hex to another, or explore that hex, or try and find out where you are, or forage for food. 
and then you're going to be rolling that die to see what happens. And there's little procedures for all of these things, including controlling how fast that you're going, what the marching order is, and whether you're resting, disease and infection, eating and drinking, what mounts and vehicles you're using, and what appropriate terrains there are for those. There's a weather system right here that you can roll on. You can eat monsters. You can go on longer voyages if you want a uh, mini game for that, including maritime travel. I do like the way that this book uses summaries. At the end of each of these turn sections, there's a little summary of the procedure that you can just walk through in case that whole section was confusing for you. Exploration turns are for dungeon crawling. Again, rules for pacing, for looking at your um, marching order. Are you a scout? Are you in the vanguard main section? Or are you in the rear guard? Um, rules for how you're going to do mapping with your players. Stuck doors, lock picking. Lock picking is a fun little mini game where each type of door has a series of three actions you have to take. So there's tap, uh, twist, and turn, and you have to say them in the correct order. They never, they never um, have the same uh, action twice in a row. So if you come across a copper lock and you do a little bit of experimenting, and you figure out that it's turn, twist, and turn, then any copper lock you're going to find in the future is going to use that same combination. So rather than using a lot of PC skill, you're going to use actual player skill where if you write down and memorize these different sequences of actions, you actually get better at unlocking doors. I kind of like mini games like that for players because it gets them more immersed, but some people like it to be more on the PC side. If you want to disarm traps or harvest materials from monsters to turn into potions, there's of course rules for that later on if you want that. There are some rules there and there's a general exploration turn procedure summary. And then we get into how combat works. So the way that initiative works is that when you roll for initiative, it determines the winning side first acts quickly, then the losing side acts quickly, uh, the winning side acts, acts slowly, and then the losing side acts slowly. Uh, this reminds me of the system from Shadow of the Demon Lord, which I think is similar. Basically, you can do one action if you want to go first, or you, if you want to do two actions, then you're going to go later. The speed and movement rules in here is one thing that is just a little bit too complicated for me. This is how basically it works. It says that you have a speed rating. And that is equal to your skill, which is one of your four attributes, minus your encumbrance. Remember, there's a whole other system for encumbrance. So you got to figure out your encumbrance. And then for every quarter of that of it that's full, that's one encumbrance point. Subtract that from your skill, and then that's going to give you your speed. For every uh, your speed, you have to look at the table over here, and that tells you how many movement dice you have. Each movement die is a D4. You roll all of those D4 and then multiply the total by 10 to figure out how far you can move in one turn. Uh, for me, that is way too many steps just to figure out how far I can move in a turn. I think just saying you can move 40 feet is perfectly sufficient. Maybe there's a penalty for having high encumbrance or something, but that's just too much for me. Sorry. Attacking by contrast is very simple. It's basically the same system we see in Into the Odd where um, damage is dealt directly. There's no checking to see if you hit. If an enemy is nearby, you roll your damage and you just deal damage to them. And then of course, they can spend blocks on their armor to reduce that damage if they can. Gambits are really nice. That's a nice system for maneuvers. What you can do is if you want to do something extra like push an enemy over or disarm him or something like that, you can reduce the amount of damage that you dealt to that person. Let's say you dealt six damage to them. You can say, I'm going to reduce that damage by four. And then that's going to give them a chance to try and save against this uh, maneuver that you're doing. And the difficulty of them saving against that maneuver is going to be how much damage you reduced by. So they'll have a difficulty of four if you reduce your damage by four. A little bit like Into the Odd, when you get down to zero hit points, you're not necessarily dead, but you're going to have to make a saving throw to see if you're basically knocked out or not. And if you survive, if you're not knocked out and you still take more damage that would put you in negative hit points, then you're going to start rolling for wounds that are serious injuries that could possibly kill you. Here's the table right here. So for example, you look at the category up here. Uh, so if you're taking physical damage, like you're being stabbed by a sword and you'd be taken down to negative six hit points, then you would look here and your arm is destroyed. Uh, if both arms go, you can't hold anything. You're also on death's door. So in other words, you're going to die soon unless someone finds a way to heal you real fast. We've got some rules here for creating your own little war bands. Rules for duels, which again has a fun little mini game system where you have or use cards. And you have to try and guess what cards your opponent has on the table or guess the order of their cards. You take turns making these guesses. And if you guess correctly, then you can take an action against them and you get a bonus. So there's a little bit of bluff going on here, which feels a lot like a hand-to-hand -hand duel where you're trying out each other's defenses, you're retreating, you're attacking. I like that system. There's a simple mass combat system and a whole section on chases along with lots of different chase developments to turn this all into a little mini game. If you want to have even multiple parties chasing one another and splitting up and running back and forth in the streets, we got um, how NPC attributes work to create your own NPCs, a short little bestiary that's really just here as a set of examples so you can see how you would make monsters. You're not really going to use this to 
um, create everything or use this as a resource for monsters. You're going to mostly have to make your own. There are, however, rules for converting NPCs and monsters from other games. So that should make any monster manual that you already own pretty useful in this. Now, the downtime turn section is quite hefty, and it just goes into lots of different downtime systems and actions that you can take when you are resting in town. Um, this is the sort of game where your character can hang out in town for a while, where they heal up, and they do things like they shop and they socialize, they can hire retainers, they can do conspicuous consumption where you throw giant feasts uh, in order to get more XP, I would assume. You can throw funerals for people, get into debt and have to pay that off, learn a trade, you can gain new talents, improve your attributes, you can train animals, you can start tinkering with your armor and equipment to make it more customized and fit you better. You want to do some alchemy with all those monster parts you picked up? You can do that. Make some powerful items. You can do rituals, solve new grimoires. It's basically everything that you can think of it has its own little one page ish system in here that you can use. And so while you're doing this, it's perfectly fine to have a, uh, an, a PC stuck in town doing one of these things for weeks or even months while you grab a different PC and head out into the wilderness to keep doing more adventures. Nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with controlling multiple PCs and uh, keeping the gold flowing in. This goes all the way up to running estates and running domains. If you want to get into the investment cost of your domain and prerequisites and benefits of holding different types of stuff, most games don't seem to get up to that level, but it's there if you want it, including faction turns. Uh, we've seen factions become more popular ever since the whole system was designed by Kevin Crawford in Stars Without Number, and it's cool to see stuff like that showing up in games like this and in Mouse Ritter where you can uh, make the world seem a little bit more alive. Lastly, we have a system for keeping track of rival uh, gangs, rival NPC parties that might be competing with you. We have scourges, which are long time threats to the world that can creep forward and get worse and worse over time, really forcing you to deal with it eventually. And we have a nice summary here at the back, along with a very complete glossary and index for all of the different terms that are used. Um, the layout is quite good. Things are put in like small caps and in uh, italics if they're important and everything is cross-referenced to one another. I do really like that there is a ludography at the end of the book that goes into all the different games and systems that influenced Errant. I really appreciate that. I am actually in here, I guess full of disclosure, um, for my game Knave, but we also see a lot of other um, people that I mentioned here like Chris McDowell for Into the Odd. And that is it for Errant. It's not a game that I would probably use whole cloth using everything all together, um, but because all the different elements are so modular, this is a book that I have drawn a lot of resources from and taken a lot of inspiration from, especially when working on Knave Second Edition, just because there are so many ideas here as to how you can take something that's often hand waved in RPGs and build a little subsystem around it that is more easy for players to game. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't, but this thing has you covered for basically any situation, no matter what you want to do. As usual, if you want to pick this up for yourself, I will put links in the description below for where you can get it in PDF or in print form. And thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.